Good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. The Republican Party is turning in on itself. We're going to explain why Florida's governor is the new lightning rod. Plus, another government website, this time to order COVID tests. It's got some problems, but we're going to check in and see if Mr. Biden will succeed where his two predecessors have failed. But first, as we come on the air tonight, a ringing alarm bell on the issue that matters most to Americans, our pocketbook. Of all the problems facing our country, crime, the border, and COVID, by broad margins, Americans worry most about inflation. And just in the past few hours, oil hit a seven-year high, now at about $86 a barrel. It's gone up a dollar since we wrote this script, as a matter of fact. When we say oil is up, you think gas, and you would be right. Right now, the average gallon of unleaded is at 3.31 a gallon. That will, of course, go up. But that's only a quarter, or maybe an eighth of the problem. The cost of everything we buy and use goes up when oil rises, from food at the grocery store to pizza delivery to airline tickets to a new TV. Everything. When the price of oil goes up, life gets exponentially more expensive. The market is, is very anticipatory here. It's looking forward to the second half of the year where balances start to, 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 um, to really tighten up. Um, you know, triple digits is not out of the question. Triple digits, so gas prices at or above $4. Tomorrow, the president faces reporters for his one-year anniversary press conference. And even his usual friends in the media report his attempts, the president's attempts, to stop skyrocketing prices just are not working. You know, that move by the president right before Thanksgiving to release a record amount of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it was made with a lot of fanfare, but it really hasn't lived up to the hype. The national average is standing at 331 a gallon. It's only down 14 cents. We are perhaps entering an economic perfect storm. Oil prices feed inflation. Interest rates go up. Mortgage rates are already heading up. The 10-year Treasury bill, which is something the finance community watches, well, it just reached a two-year high. Housing prices are going down, and those all combine to tank the stock market today. The Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P all finished deep in the red. The Dow at levels not seen in a month. S&P, NASDAQ, tech-heavy, down to two- or three-month lows. We're going to bring in John Katsimedias, whose businesses touch each of these issues, in just a couple of minutes, I want to move on now to an issue that is also at everyone's kitchen table. We're leaving in a time where everyone has a strong opinion about our public education system. It's arguably the single most important kitchen table issue next to the economy that we just talked about. It's about people's kids. Parents are passionate about that. Namely, folks are very passionate about, about whether or not parents should have a say in their child's education. But this extremely important debate can often be overshadowed simply because of the power of the teachers' unions. Parents often don't get a say. This is from the Wall Street Journal op-ed page. Why the Chicago Teachers' Union always gets what it wants. It can strike and quite literally ignore children because Illinois lawmakers give it extraordinary powers. Under Illinois law, it is compulsory for state and local governments to bargain with public sector unions. Teachers have the power to force ar arbitration, allowing them to go on strike, and they can do it over a wide range of employment issues. But this isn't just the case in Illinois. Teachers unions have collective bargaining power in all of these states you see on your screen. California, New York, Minnesota, Nebraska, even Ohio, among a lot of others. If you're not familiar, collective bargaining is the process in which working people through their unions negotiate contracts with the, with the employers to determine their terms of employment, including pay benefits, hours, leave, job health and safety policies, among so many more. To fully understand the influence these unions have, just follow the money. In Illinois, for example, teachers unions have spent one and a half million dollars lobbying just in 2019. The groups funneled $1.2 million in political action committees and campaigns. Because of their efforts, these unions are able to make critical decisions that directly impact your kids. COVID walkouts that we saw in Chicago, of course, come to mind as of late. In fact, there are more than 6,000 active school disruptions across the country right now. Average class size in America is 21 student, which means more than 125,000 kids are out of the classroom right now at a minimum. 
We all know how online learning negatively affects our children. We've been having this classroom conversation for weeks now. Lately, the focus has been on the power of these teacher unions. And to be fair to the unions, we have searched far and wide for a union representative or teacher to come on and defend their position, to defend their power. This is just a partial list of all of the people and groups who have either turned us down or never responded. The invitation remains open. It always will. But we are going to keep covering the story. And to do that, we bring in a man who spent six years shaping public policy at the Illinois Public Policy Institute, Ted Dabrowski, currently the president at WirePoints. Ted, I really appreciate you being here. The work you guys have done is uh, nothing short of extraordinary. Uh, are we to believe, as we saw over the past week in Chicago, that the teachers unions in many places are the ones who actually have the most say over kids' education? Oh, there's a lot of states where they have way too much power. Uh, in the case of Chicago, just take this example. In the last 10 years, they have struck or walk out, walked out five times, and they put 300,000 kids out of school and, and, and thrown families into chaos. So it's way too much power if they can strike five times in a decade. So here, the, over the end of Christmas break, beginning of January, they struck for four or five days, basically just walked out over COVID concerns, even though everyone said that it was safe to be in the classroom. They're so emboldened. What are some of the more outrageous demands that we're seeing around the country? What's next for the unions to demand? Well, I think you know, they have to take their, everybody should watch what's happening in Chicago because the lawmakers- This is the canary in the coal mine. This is the canary in the coal mine. Okay. I mean, they would love to export this to other countries, uh, to other states. Um, you know, it's the lawmakers who empower the unions. It's the lawmakers who pass the legislation that allows, for example, a, a teacher's union to strike or to demand lots of different um, benefits or, or salaries. And so that's where you have to look at the problem. It's the lawmakers who empower them. So uh, watch out for that. In great research by Andrew Roberts, our producer, where he pulled out in terms of following the money, $1.2 million in political action committees and campaigns, just not a lot of money. Is there another reason these unions have so much power? Well, the fact that they can strike over lots of issues gives them that power. The fact that the lawmakers, like, or, or for example, Lori Lightfoot or Rahm Emanuel, they always roll over, they always cave. When so where's, where's that political power? Why are these mayors so afraid of the unions and not afraid of the parents? Well, now you come back to the money. Well, the, uh, the, the campaigns get a lot of money f and votes from the unions. And remember, mm -hmm. it's not just the money, it's the salaries, it's the pensions, it's the benefits that are given in exchange for the votes. And that's where, they, that's where this, this uh, you know, marriage works. It's interesting because we saw a little bit of daylight between the mayor in Chicago and the teachers unions over this issue. This was President Biden over the summer talking about his support of the teachers unions. The American people saw it, they get it. And they understand what you've been saying for years, that you are professionals, all of you. All of you. All of us have a responsibility to make sure that you have what you need to educate our children safely, equitably, and well. Is there a subjugation by the Democratic Party of parents' rights for teachers' rights? Um, all you need to do is look across the country where, where parents are really unhappy with CRT. They're unhappy with the, with the mandates, the COVID mandates. They're not happy with a lot of the curriculum, and you see that in a lot of the sex education in, in young classes. There's a lot that parents are unhappy about. And I think all you need to do is look at Virginia, where they couldn't get changed by asking the school system to do it, so they had to fire the lawmakers. And that's exactly what happened with Youngkin. Are you starting to see, and I know you study this, any fear in the teachers' unions of what happening in Virginia being repeated rather than what happened in Chicago being repeated? I don't know if we're seeing the fear yet, but what I do see are more and more mama bears standing up, especially in Illinois. You're starting to see in, in somewhere where we haven't seen uh, parents take on the unions or the unions have been too strong, you're starting to see a big, big movement of mama bears acting, rising, and uh, I think you're gonna see a big, a big push and a big battle. Yeah, it sure seems like the, the battle lines are certainly coming. It's fascinating what's happening in America's schools, right? Because not only do you have teachers going on strikes, you have kids going on strikes and walking out as well. I would have loved to have struck for any issue uh, humanly possible and probably made up a few while I was in school, but the school board or the mayor is supposed to be the adult in the room. Right now, you've got two sets of inmates running the asylum, the kids and the teachers. I'd add a third. I'd add the administration as well, the administrations. Okay. So, so, so what? obviously, the teachers' unions aren't going to give up power voluntarily. They're going to fight tooth and nail for it. 
Can simply changing the legislature or changing the legislature, say in Illinois, get that power back? Well, you know, look at what's happening in Texas, for example, Georgia, North Carolina. They don't allow the unions to bargain. The collective bargaining process is illegal. So in that, in those states, they give the power to the to the taxpayers, to the parents. In Illinois, all the power goes to the unions. None of it goes to the parents, and that's why things have to flip. Hey, this is incredible. Your piece in the Wall Street Journal is one of uh, the better pieces I've seen laying this out. Illinois, one of the only states where it's legal for teachers to strike. So, as you said, watch what happened in Illinois for a state uh, near you. Ted, uh, great work. Come back and talk to us. Thank you. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. This uh, this isn't going away. The story and issue of our uh, decade, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. All right, back now to the key issue everyday Americans are struggling with, the economy. John Katsimides, businessman whose businesses touch each of these issues, owns the entire supply chain from an oil refining company to one of New York's largest grocery store chains, uh, joins us now. Uh, John, you called this last week, uh, oil prices go up and inflation gets worse. Oil prices have hit all-time highs in the last few days, and that means that prices in the food industry, prices in travel, prices in clothing, every single retail store, the prices will continue to rise. Uh, being in the food business, we've already seen price increases coming from manufacturers for February and for March. So if oil keeps going up, now let's talk about the facts of life. Uh, Putin is laughing all the way to the bank. Uh, Putin is stirring the pot in uh, uh, Ukraine. And as he stirs the pot, the prices rise. And if he continues to stir the pot, you might see $100 oil. And we're paying him. We're the ones paying him right now $87, $88 a, a barrel for oil. And we might be paying him $100 a barrel for oil. And he's laughing all the way to the bank. So I, I, for all we have to do is buy you know, it domestically. I, I, I'm going to get to the domestic policy in a second, but I just want to sort of have folks understand where the costs go. Uh, if oil goes to $90 a barrel tomorrow, say, how long does it take for the price increases of that to work its way all the way through down to the grocery store shelf? If you see $90 a barrel on your TV set for, for a uh, barrel of oil tomorrow, I would say in the next 60 days, you will see inflation at the pump. You'll see $5. Uh, a gallon oil or uh, gasoline, uh, you'll see higher prices uh, by March in the grocery stores. And, and then it just keeps going up. And obviously, it takes a long time when for oil price, once oil prices come down, it takes a long, lot longer for the prices of everyday goods to go down. You talked about domestic oil production. 2019, 12.2 million barrels per day. 2021, 11.8 million barrels per day. That's only down 3%. That doesn't come close to well, accounting for the huge increase of prices. You, you, well, you, you're wrong there because I think oh. in 2020 or 2019, 20, we were up to as high as 13.3 barrels a day. We're down to 11.5. We're down 2 million barrels a day. And we can bring prices down by, by producing more in America, in North America. Why, why give the business to OPEC? Why give the business to Putin? And uh, they're, they're just laughing at us, uh, uh, and it's sad. Yeah, well, you, you say, why, why not give the business to America? And the Biden administration will tell you because it's environmentally unsound and, and the like. We can debate, debate that later. I want to get back, though, to the crude oil price line graph 2012 to now, uh, going back all the way to, to $100 a barrel oil. Uh, you can just imagine what that would do to the economy. I, I appreciate always you coming on and talking about this and explaining this to us, but... Aren't you and other everybody from grocery store owners to oil refiner refiners just getting rich off of these high oil prices? Absolutely not. We make margin. We make if we're making a, a ten cent margin on an item. If the if the price of the price of the uh, item goes up by the manufacturer a dollar, we're going to raise it a dollar. We don't we don't increase it uh, more than that. It, it's normal course of business. Hey, if it costs us more, we have to sell no, uh, it for yeah, more. Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand that. It, it does seem, though, that the oil companies themselves, their stock prices are going up. They're, they're making more money just because you know, if you make 10% 10, 10 on $50 a barrel oil versus 10% on $100 a barrel of oil, you, you make more money. 
it's hard for yeah, a but lot it doesn't of people- have to go to a hundred dollars a barrel. It doesn't have to go because I, I think we reached a peak in the United States or, or in North America of thirteen point three or thirteen point five million barrels a day. If we start going up, the price of oil is going to start going down. The price of gasoline will start going down, and then it, it'll, it'll be a great cycle instead of a vicious cycle that we have now. Yeah, well, and also, if it, to your point earlier, as you tied this together so well, uh, if the price of oil starts going down and we can buy more domestically, it starts putting more pressure on Putin because uh, he's poorer. And that was a, an excellent point about probably the biggest foreign policy uh, crisis we're dealing with right now. Hey, John, it was always good to see you. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, good to see Thank you. Thank you for Thank having you. me. The government's website to order free COVID tests is up, well, and sort of running. There's some problems. We're going to tell you about those and why it's kind of emblematic of how the government's handled the pandemic in general. Plus, all of a sudden, everyone seems to care about the Uyghurs on Twitter. Where was this outrage before an NBA owner stuck his foot in his mouth? That's Facebook billionaire, part investor in the NBA's Golden State Warriors, talking about the greatest genocide since Nazi Germany's extermination of the Jews. He was on his podcast. Currently, millions of Uyghurs, a minority Muslim group, are in communist concentration camps. For example, here's a video of them shaved and shackled by the communists in Beijing for transport to the camps. Twitter didn't much like Chamas Hapaliata's honesty, so he clarified. Everybody loves to clarify, right? In re-listening to this week's podcast, I recognize that I came across lacking empathy. I acknowledge that entirely as a refugee, my family fled a country with its own human rights issues. So this is something very much part of the experience. To be clear, my belief is that human rights matter, whether in China or the United States or elsewhere, full stop. The honesty, again, he doesn't name the Uyghurs once. And this time he added some moral whataboutism. According to him, the U.S. and China seem to have the same record on human rights. Our friend Matt Gorman wrote on Twitter, the sad part is this took 10 hours and tens of thousands of dollars in crisis comms to help write. There are many sad parts of this story, especially for the Uyghurs, but also for the sanctimonious blue checkmark crowd who all have iPhones built in China, many who wear Nike shoes, and very few do all that much to stand up to the Chinese. The only thing Kobe Hall hates more than sanctimony is hypocrisy. Producer for News Nation, founding editor of Mediaite, America's premier website for the news about the news. Kobe, uh, boy... I didn't know so many people cared about the Uyghurs until they could dunk on Chamath. Well, uh, he was an easy target to dunk on. And first of all, he was straight, for, uh, character straight from uh, HBO's Silicon Valley. Like he really kind of played the part and, and had zero empathy. Um, and what he really was guilty of is a lack of virtue signaling. Because what he said was actually true. No one really has cared about the Uyghurs. Like, everyone is willing to tweet about their plight, and it is a serious plight. But when he says that it's not something that he cares about, he's speaking for a nation. He's speaking for the world because, truthfully, no one cares enough about them to really have done anything, yeah. especially the NBA. But as you point out, you know, there's a, no shortage of people who are suddenly experts on this, and it, you know, doesn't cost anything to tweet out your concern and to dunk on this. Poor billionaire, and uh, you know, he got it's, home it's always like, it's like thoughts reason. and prayers, right? From every politician during a crisis, we have, thoughts and prayers are there. Um, I'm thinking about Tommy Vitor uh, of the Obama administration, now of Crooked Media. Um, he tweeted out this: uh, "What an arrogant, ignorant, insufferable billionaire! Something we can't say on TV doesn't just say that voters are unaware of the genocide against the Uyghurs. He says he personally doesn't care. Another word we can't say on TV: this guy and his what about is an idiocy." Um, I actually kind of got excited for a minute when I read that. It's like, oh, there's somebody on the left speaking about this. And then we did some research. Uh, Tommy Vitor has not tweeted about the fate of the Uyghurs once in the last two years. Shocker. <laughs> and, I, and I'm willing to bet that he tweeted that from his iPhone that was made in China by effectively slave labor. Now, again, I mean, this is a perfect, it's perfectly emblematic of the current 
sort of media, political media landscape that we're in, that it, it means more, there's more value on hitting your opponent and making fun of someone that you don't like than actually you know, picking up the pen or doing something that has merit. And so the people get rewarded for dunking on one another. And you know, this poor guy, like he was being honest, he came across awfully and he got owned and he had to apologize. And he probably won't be doing a lot of publicity from this yeah. point forward. But come on, like yeah. you know, let's let's talk about the NBA not doing anything with the Uyghurs because they know that it's an enormous market and they're succumbing right. to incredible pressure. Yeah, well, and, and this sort of goes to that point uh, of the incredible pressure. Uh, this was not the only thing that he said on his podcast. Take a listen. But boy, does he have the moral absolutism to speak out about every social justice issue that exists in America. You guys pointed this out. The other organization that has really sort of laid themselves bare on this one is ESPN, who couldn't wait to cover social justice and what everything LeBron James is concerned about, and not one word about an owner of an NBA team now making national headlines. Right. This Uyghur story got zero coverage as of, I don't know, four o'clock today, got nary mentioned once, not once on ESPN because they're in you know, huge corporate partners with the NBA. And I'm sure Adam Silver, who I think is a terrific commissioner, is looking down and saying, yeah, don't uh, don't cover this. Let this go away. Um, because, you know, again, no one is doing anything. People only care about this issue to the degree that they can chide someone, wag their finger, and sort of virtue signal that mm. they're not virtue signaling yeah. in the right way. And the whole thing is really absurd. It's, well, and, it's, and how, it's kind of a sad commentary. Yeah, and what a privilege both you and I are in that we work for a media company, media companies, that don't have any of those foreign ties or the need for the Chinese market so we can say whatever we think on these issues and report the facts as they are. Colby, good to see you. Thanks. Leland, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, pleasure's all ours. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he's not bowing to Trump, but does he really have what it takes to challenge the former president? We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. President Biden's going to take questions from reporters at a formal news conference tomorrow. It's his first since early November, and there's a lot of bad news for the White House these days. We've talked about inflation so far. We've talked about anger about schools. We've talked about soaring prices of goods on America's minds and a rash of empty store shelves. This is a News Nation poll. 92% of Americans are concerned about inflation. Only 20% of Americans say they're better off financially than they were a year ago. Carly Pearson, opinion writer for USA Today, supporter of the president, joins us now. Uh, good to see you, Carly. You know, you've got to think that the president's going to get at least one softball question. Mr. President, what are your biggest accomplishments this year? Hi. Well, I just want to say thanks for having me on the show. Um, I watched your show on Friday and I agreed with something you said that, you know, if we don't talk to people who have different views than us, then uh, we're not doing a very good job with our opinion journalism. Um, in terms of the softball question, I expect he'll get at least one easy one. Uh, he has some big achievements to name, uh, like a $1.9 trillion aid package and other things he's been uh, trying to get through. Um, push through the door. He faces a lot of obstacles. Um, but all in all, I think he has a lot to be proud of one yeah. year in. And you, you can argue, look, that the, the economy is doing well and you've got low unemployment and huge job growth. That's sort of the talking point of the White House. But if you think about how the American people feel, it's not translating. Uh, ask, check all that apply. 50% of Americans frustrated, 49% disappointed. 40% nervous, only 25% calm, only 25% satisfied. It's resulted in a 14-point shift to the GOP. Uh, this is the biggest swing we've seen since decades. Why are the accomplishments you just talked about not translating? You know, that's a great question, and I love this poll because I think I would check nervous and you know dissatisfied and at the same time in the same breath i think i can say biden's doing as good of a job as he can i don't work for the white house i'm not a politician um biden isn't my favorite uh however what he inherited 
didn't he didn't inherit the economy and he didn't inherit the the pandemic in a vacuum right the economy um has a very complicated context which we have to keep in mind anytime we talk about um like yeah. for example inflation uh which you were talking about on the earlier segment right yeah, there's, no, there's I, a context I, I, to that no there, there, there is unfortunately when you have george washington's job the american people tend to give you a very short leash on blaming the guy before you it's just the way the nature of the office yeah, is yeah he got it good that wasn't <laughs> fair at all when when you talk about the reset um that that's coming and that this has been a common refrain and, and you're among people who say well i don't biden isn't my first pick but he's as good as we get where where does this reset go? Because it seems like half the party wants him to reset more to the left, and the other half the party wants him to reset more to the right. The only real way to reset is to bring in new people. Is is would you be on the Ron Klain needs to be uh, writing his book these days or refreshing his resume? Um, you know, bringing in new people. I don't know. I think we saw a lot of instability during the Trump administration in terms of being able to fulfill to fill a cabinet positions and judiciary. I don't think he needs to bring in new people. Um, I think the point you brought up just a minute ago with people aren't feeling the satisfaction is a very good point. You know, American people are hurting. American people don't have enough money to take care of their families. They don't have enough money to keep the lights on. They have to choose between health care and putting food on the table. Those aren't the kind of choices. I think this is something you and I can definitely agree on. Mm. Those aren't the kind of choices that people in the wealthiest nation in the world should have to be making. Yeah, no, and, I, I think and, there's yeah, there, there, there's obviously honest disagreement about why they're being forced to make those choices and what the solutions to them are. Uh, Paul Begala, though, uh, has a different, Begala has a slightly different view of this. Take a listen. He is putting the full force of the presidency behind it. I, I think the problem for the Democrats right now is, is not that they have bad leaders. They have bad followers. Are, are you, Carly, among those to blame? A bad follower? Yeah. Am I to blame for the economy in, in the United States of America? That's what he said. He's a Democrat. Well, I'm, I mean, you know, uh, I think we can paint lots of broad stro strokes here. Um, bad followers. I think there's a lot of dissonance in the country. Uh, everyone on the political spectrum can pretty much agree with that. I think we, uh, there's, I think, like you said, we can agree on different solutions. Um, but there are certain things that have to happen. We need to catch up in healthcare. We need to catch up in education. And there are lessons to be learned mm. from the pandemic. Yeah, they're, um, they're... A lot of them come with unfortunate circumstances. But for example, we need to invest to some extent in the socialization of healthcare and education. We can't fall behind no, on, well, we're, on we're technology. Yeah, well, we're, we're definitely. I don't know if we're behind in technology when it comes to medicine, but there, there's some different points there. Hey, Carly, well, I, we appreciate isn't the same as medicine. Yeah, we 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 appreciate you being with us. Thank you. It's good to see you. And obviously, uh, we'll have a lot to talk about after the uh, press conference tomorrow. Thank you. Rule Thank number you. one in politics, right? When your opponent is self-destructing, get out of the way. And Republicans sometimes have a hard time doing that. They're facing tensions of their own in the run-up to the midterms and then to the 2024 race. Matt Schlapp, chairman of the Conservative Political Action Coalition, uh, is with us. All right, are these divisions, Matt, in the Republican Party real or manufactured? What divisions? <laughs> All right, I'll give you the headline from the New York Times. I'm guessing you're saying it's manufactured. Who is the king of Florida? Tensions rise between Trump and former acolyte DeSantis, a man Mr. Trump believes he put on the map, has been acting far less like an acolyte and more like a future competitor, Mr. Trump complains. Has he complained to you about this? He has not, uh, although I keep my conversations with him confidential. I Fair think enough. Ron DeSantis is doing a great job in Florida. And I imagine as we head into 2024, after a fantastic victory this year, like we had the year before, uh, I think we're going to have some competition on the Republican side. I'm okay with that. That, that makes an interesting point. Um, Mr. Trump can do no wrong in the eye of his followers. We've learned that. Uh, we have not learned that about Ron DeSantis. Is there a way to have a different leader of the Republican Party without a political pushing aside of President Trump? Well, it's hard to answer that question without first acknowledging that Donald Trump is overwhelmingly popular with Republican voters. But, and yeah, there, there's no argument there. And, 
There's absolutely no argument there. Donald Trump will. Yeah. Here's the thing that's hard for, let's say Donald Trump decides not to run and someone like Ron DeSantis or Mike Pompeo or Ted Cruz gets the nomination. Um, it, Trump would have made the decision himself, so that part's fine. But the second piece is interesting. Would you want to be a Republican president, assuming they win? And I think the odds are that Republican will be elected after this, you know, Biden presidency, what it is. Uh, you know, would you want to have Donald Trump on the sidelines when you're the president? My guess is he's going to stay fully engaged, be opinionated and be a real force in Republican politics, whether he runs or not. And that's why I think he probably ends up running. Certainly, uh, George Will, other side of the Republican or even conservative than you are, um, he said last night, better for Trump to run against 10 than against one. Uh, is that a fair characterization? Well, you know, George Will really hates uh, Donald Trump, yeah, so sure. I assume he's saying he, he's saying uh, it's better to beat Donald Trump if no, only no, he, one he was runs saying, he was saying that He was saying that for Trump to run against 10, it would be like 2016. It'd be pretty easy for him. Yeah. If he had to face a singular person like a Ron DeSantis, it might be harder. Yeah, well, that, that's what I was trying to say, but you articulated it clearer. Yeah, I, m maybe there's some arguments to that. Look, I've said all along that I think... Donald Trump does better when there's a competitive situation. He likes a competitive situation. So if he were to decide to run and some people like maybe Nikki Haley and others decided to run, I don't necessarily view that as a sign of weakness. I think it would sharpen his skills and make him ready. How ironic, maybe running against Hillary Clinton uh, in November. You know, we did that segment a couple of, uh, about a week ago about please know we do not want a repeat of 2016, although I know there's a lot of Republicans who would like it because they view her as beatable. Uh, I just got to get your thought real quick on this. Uh, Daily Beast, disillusioned Trump officials reportedly meet to plot against uh, ex-boss. I know these are some people who you weren't a huge yeah. fan of to begin with. Uh, it feels like virtually everybody in the Republican Party has tried to kill the king and they've never been successful. Yeah, and you have to look at these people. I, I read the list. I'm really disappointed yeah. in them. You know, I served President Bush and Vice President Cheney. I disagreed with them on things. I try to be very careful, even with my public comments today. Um, you know, they gave me a chance as a young man to have a very important job, and I respect them very much. And I think when you serve a president, I can understand fighting against them if they really offend your conscience. But this is just, I believe, they're, they never were for Trump. They don't like the association with President Trump, and they're trying to enhance their yeah. careers and their notoriety by attacking him. You're right, it just makes Donald Trump stronger. It makes him look like even more that he will vanquish the swamp. And this is just the swamp being the swamp. Yeah, well, and um, you know, it's interesting uh, what you say about your service to former presidents, because other people have said that about you as well and been admiring uh, of that quality, which is one that you continue to embody. Matt, it's good to see you, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Lulu. Yeah, good, good perspective. With the school debate raging across the country, are masks doing more harm to your children than good? What's the benefit? What's the cost? We'll be back with that. And tonight on Banfield, a secret list with the names of eight high-profile men. Will the court reveal the John Doe's involved in the Epstein sex trafficking ring? Tonight, 9 Central, 10 Eastern. You have a fundamental right enshrined in law by this General Assembly to make decisions with regard to your child's upbringing, education, and care. And we will protect and reassert that right. Newly inaugurated Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin won on giving power back to the parents. It's something a lot of parents in a lot of states wish they had. And part of that power, back to the parents, is a new executive order banning school mask mandates. Parents may, in the governor's words, elect for their children not to be subject to any mask mandate in effect at the school or education program. Schools and parents across Virginia are divided. Now there are threats of lawsuits from both sides. Mask enthusiasts and school districts are thinking of suing the governor's office and vice versa. School psychologist Dr. Robin Kloskowitz is with us now to discuss. All right, Doc. We can all agree that being in school with a mask is better than distance learning, right? Definitely. Kids need to be in school. That's the one thing that's too risky to avoid. And the 
The research on whether or not masks work or not uh, to prevent transmission is, is dicey at best. There was a North Carolina study, not a single child to teacher transmission among 90,000 kids. Um, but I'm looking at some of this Brown University data that we, we researched. Early learning composite scores uh, went way down in 2021 as kids were forced to wear masks. Verbal development also just crashed in 2021. There's a real cost to kids of wearing masks. Yes, kids do. We have seen, the numbers aren't lying. The NWEA just came out with statistics that math and reading scores are going down. We used to think that, you know, online learning could help children just as much. They could do math, they could do reading online. But in actuality, we're seeing that the learning is suffering and the social and emotional learning is really suffering. Explain why wearing a mask even during in-person learning hurts social development. So actually, the research shows that children can read social and emotional cues while they and teachers are wearing masks between the ages of about 7 and 13. The older you are, the better you are at doing it. But the younger you are, when you're under 7, preverbal infants, toddlers really need the entire mm. face. The younger you are, the more of the face you need in order to be able to sort of connect speech to emotional states. Yeah, and the, and the more... The youngest kids need to be able to see their teachers' faces uh, in the like. You know, you think about it in Chicago, more kids die of gunshots in Chicago than they do of COVID. You don't make where kid, kids wear bulletproof vests. Hard to make the argument for them to wear masks. So I certainly believe masks and being in in-person school is preferable to, you know, to being in virtual school. Because I think that children yeah. go to school to learn to socialize, but, and that you cannot do, you know, at home. Yeah. But children, but not wearing masks, or at least having teachers yeah. wear clear masks is infinitely preferable. Uh, there's probably a reason in Europe they're now all not wearing masks for this very same reason among kids and because the transmission's so low. Hey, I'm really sorry, we gotta run, but we appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you. Quick clarification. Tommy Vitor, uh, formerly of the Obama administration, who had tweeted uh, about the Uyghurs and about the NBA, he has tweeted about the Uyghurs and about the past year, did a podcast on them as well and the concentration camps they are being held in. Tommy, we apologize. We're glad you tweeted the way you did, showed a lot of courage. And of course, you're welcome anytime on the show uh, to discuss it. It'll be a good conversation. As we press on, Free at-home testing for all Americans. Will the USPS live up to the promises and deliver for you? Plus, on Diana Abrams tonight, a toddler left in a hot car to die. How the father's sentence could now be overturned. That's right after our show. Just as Omicron peaks in parts of the country, the Biden administration's free in-home testing project is finally showing signs of life. The president, I'm sure, will talk about it tomorrow in his news conference. It's just been a month after announcing the project, and they have a website where you can order four free in-home COVID tests that will come right to your doorstep. And let's be honest, nothing says the government is serious about an emergency like a new website that promises to ship products within seven to 12 days of ordering, plus one to three days in transit while supplies last. Let's do a quick thought experiment. You are tasked with solving a life and death problem involving websites, supply chains, order management, delivery, and warehousing. Would you contract A, Amazon, B, FedEx, C, Walmart, D, UPS, E, all of the above and encourage competition, or F, give the single contract to the US Postal Service? Yes, the White House chose F, the Postal Service, the same organization that recently had the dubious distinction of both raising prices and lowering service standards. Congratulations, we the taxpayers are now paying more for a quasi-government company to do less. President Biden, of course, isn't the first commander in chief to go down the website route to solve a problem. Here is President Trump also trying to use a website to solve something involving COVID at the start of the pandemic. We are actually still waiting for that website. In fairness, President Trump's Google website never happened. Compared to the Obamacare website, which obviously is what the former president was mentioning, that turned into a Saturday Night Live skit. 
Government rolling out a new website to solve a problem is just a little bit like giving a puppy to that stepchild that you're not exactly close with. And yes, we did choose some cute puppies. Puppies are an easy solution. So are websites in theory. They placate somebody for a few hours, and then invariably there is a big mess to clean up. Again, this is not partisan. This is a clip from 2009 in Oklahoma. That's a red state with a Republican governor that also had some website issues. Tonight, we've learned the state's unemployment website isn't working. Earlier this month, the site went down after a Sunday after a server glitch. And of course, it happened in blue states as well. Here's Illinois at the start of the pandemic. An historic surge of jobless claims crashed the state's unemployment system last week. Now it is back up and running. So with now more than a decade of data, data it should come as no surprise. The latest government website to solve a problem is already having big problems. The AP reports that just within a couple of minutes of the website going live, that if one person in an apartment or condo building ordered a test, the address verification system blocks out anybody else at the condo or apartment building from ordering their set of four tests. How emblematic of the government trying to deal with COVID. Which brings us to our social media question of the day asked by our intrepid executive producer, Chris Russell. What will we fix first, COVID or the website? Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all those at Leland Bitter. Tomorrow, we tackle China again in the Olympics. There's no snow in Beijing. The communists are hacking athletes' phones. The Chinese are torturing millions. Yet American athletes are en route for the games. There will be the only ones, the athletes, because you actually can't buy tickets. Tomorrow, we're going to expose the shady money that keeps giving Olympic glory to China. Dan's next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.